Thank you so much uh, to Bordru and Birgit for uh, the invitation to speak and, and, uh, and give this uh, uh, Global Disconnect annual lecture. It's a real honor for me to be able to do so. Um, and yes, uh, the title has changed. Uh, and this is because when Bordru reached out to me, it was um, a few months ago, and I didn't, I haven't, I hadn't finished the presentation yet. In fact, I hadn't written it. So this is new work in progress, which is always, uh, for me, more interesting uh, to to give uh, something like this. But it definitely connects, and I've written it specifically for this event. And uh, hopefully, it will open up some uh, useful and productive uh, lines of inquiry to set up the terms of the discussion for the nomadic camera workshop. Um, thank you also to the Historicious colleague for uh, hosting this uh, event. What a, a beautiful place to, to be and uh, be able to present some work. I do, I, I thought the screen might be a little bigger. You never know these days, but um, unfortunately it might be a little hard to read in the back. Um, my apologies, but um, I'll be speaking out pretty much everything, so you'll, you'll get it if you can't quite make out the, uh, the words on the screen. Okay. Um, so, and this should be about 45 to 50 minutes, um, and then we have a Q&A afterwards, which I really look forward to hearing um, your questions, if, if there are any, or comments. All right. Uh, so the Nomadic Camera Workshop, uh, in the next couple of days, uh, sets out to ask how migratory dislocations are interconnected, uh, perhaps even mutually determinative with the technical evolutions of the mobile medium of photography. My own entrance uh, into this question goes back to my book, um, which Birgit mentioned, The Migrant Image, uh, published in 2013, in which I investigated how images of migration within experimental documentary practice merged with the migration of images within the cultural economy. At the time, I was thinking about the so-called documentary turn in contemporary art, where practitioners were turning increasingly to documentary representation at a time when the truth claims were progressively tenuous uh, as a result of technologies like digitization, um, social media and algorithmic governance, uh, which were intensifying the evident and by then long-standing post-structuralist critiques of representation. And I'm just putting a few examples of artistic practices that I engaged with in the migrant image on the screen. So you have um, stills from Steve McQueen's Western Deep, uh, the Autolith groups, Autolith One, their first film, uh, Hito Steirel's film November, and Ursula Biman's uh, Sahara Chronicle. Um, so in terms of that critique of representation, let me mention four points of articulation. Though there are certainly more, but these are the ones that I was uh, thinking about and concerned with. The first was, uh, has been Bruno Latour's proposed necessity of making a cultural and representational turn as much as a scientific and juridical political transition from what he called matters of fact to matters of concern. Um, a second point was Jacques Ranciere's uh, notion of what he called film fables, where documentary fiction is not necessarily some evil lie uh, or the flip side of reality that people try to pass off for it, but rather the means of art to construct a system of represented actions and assembled forms and internally coherent signs. A third point was Hito Steirel's interrogations of what she called documentary uncertainty, according to which uncertainty, she wrote, is not some shameful lack which has to be hidden, but instead constitutes the core quality of contemporary documentary models as such. And finally, for Carrie Lambert Beatty's concept of parafiction, lying somewhere between fact and fantasy, inspiring practices of critical doubt and gen generative fabulation. So it was clear at the time that we had entered a period that uh, was and can be still called post-representational in the double sense of 
political regimes of democracy no longer representational because they've been corrupt, corrupted by corporate wealth. Um, the unfolding current events in the United States is a perfect example of this. Um, and two, the truth regimes of representation are riddled with uncertainty. So what did this mean, I asked, for uh, images of migration, um, like this one by Ito Barada, uh, as much as for the migration of images. Not only were people seeking new political identities through endless border crossings, but images were increasingly mobile and in the process being reframed and recaptioned, recontextualized, resignified, uh, and, and their meanings newly shaped by matters of concern and increasingly becoming uncertain, untrustworthy, and cut off from the ground of unshakable truth. My argument was basically that this documentary uncertainty had in fact always been the case, uh, even if technologies of representation have shifted and mutated over the years and continue to do so. Um, think of, for instance, Karl Marx's historical materialism, where the criterion of truth is in practice. Uh, or Michel Foucault's proposal that in moments of conjunctural crisis, we may need to fiction truth for political gain. Or more recently, Olufemi Taiwo uh, and his contention that practice must be evaluated in terms of what kind of world we want to build. If images and their regimes of meaning were not ultimately to reflect and support ruling class interests, then we face the continuation of class struggle at the site of material practices. Labor, access to resources, infrastructure, wealth are all at stake, but also class struggle at the site of uh, the migrant image. So I want to continue uh, this line of, um, of thinking today uh, but following more recent representational turns in the face of ever greater epistemic uncertainties in relation to the subject of climate migration. Specifically, I'll be considering the forensic turn of assembling new image-based practices of verification, legal challenge, and social movement struggle so as to respond precisely to the fraught post-internet conundrum of documentary uncertainty, which is newly mediated by social media distributed deep fakes, chat GPT, and AI generated imagery, through which bad actors construct a dark epistemology of non-knowability in order to occlude corporate, military, and state human rights abuses and environmental crimes. So I'm just putting on the screen um, a few image results uh, through using an algorithmic generator. When I entered the question uh, or the, the query to, to picture a climate refugee, this is Dali 2, um, the image generator. And you can see based on the results of this image, of, of the, the processes, um, just how Dali 2 um, is actively, obviously shaping reality according to all these kinds of racialized stereotypes of climate migration, which it's crucial to be aware of. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in my talk. Um, so in some ways, forensic architecture, um, which I'll be talking about, uh, is, in, is a response to this kind of um, potentiality. So I also want to consider another kind of turn, and that is from figure to ground the one that moves us from the representational focus on migrants as figures of displacement to the centering of the ground, or what forensic architecture calls field causalities that produce migration in the first place. So climate migration is conventionally marked by the subjective photojournalistic focus on the migrant as conventionally victimized object of displacement, whether owing to economic desperation, the violence of war, regional conflicts, or increasingly environmental causes. And here I'm most concerned with involuntary or forced migration rather than more privileged forms of voluntary displacement or cultural nomadism, which, I'll critically in, uh, which I critically interrogated in uh, that book, The Migrant Image. 
typical of conventional photojournalism are figurations of displaced subjects, personal interest stories, biographical narratives, which highlight the subjective suffering at the often violent site of border regimes, uh, the arrests and expulsions, the detainment and the waiting, the camps and the informal economies, and so on. This logic of thematic focus is oftentimes mirrored in artistic, photographic, documentary, and media-based approaches to migration. One exemplary, critical, and by now familiar example, at least familiar to some of us, uh, of this approach is Phil Collins' project, uh, his video piece called How to Make a Refugee from 1999, um, a still of which you see on the screen, which was filmed during the Kosovo conflict uh, in that year, during the artist's trip to a refugee uh, camp in Skopje, Macedonia, during the Kosovo War, where Collins documented the moments before, during, and after a photo shoot organized by a team of journalists of a family of Kosovan Albanian refugees in order to critically investigate the mainstream media's visual simplification and reductive categorizations of people in conflict zones and how cameras make refugees through the production of images for political instrumentalization, whether for humanitarian regimes or reactionary blame, and for aesthetic consumption, often for liberal empathy uh, and commodified images. Or more recently, we could consider Ai Weiwei's um, <clears throat> film and his nomadic camera in Human Flow from 2017 which traces roots of migration all over the world in a seemingly endless attempt to tail flows of migration in order to issue performative gestures of respect and care, seemingly sincerely expressed by the artist. But to what end, uh, other than the conventional ideological engine of the production of compassion? while doing not much to challenge the actual material and structural causes of migration. And just some more, there's many, many examples of this, but just a few uh, other examples that I've recently come across. Nil Yalter's piece, Tower of Babel, Immigrants, uh, from the 1970s and also put together uh, in 2016. Um, or Wangechi Mutu, The End of Caring All, from uh, 2015, which again focuses on figures of uh, migration. So the approach shared by these diverse practices corresponds to what the art historian uh, T.J. Clark in a 2002 discussion of the migrations work of Santiago Salgado, the Brazilian photographer, critically identified uh, what he called a photography of faces, where socio-political and economic complexity was reduced to the appearance of physiognomy in a reductive act of visual simplification. So the problems with this kind of approach, in my view, are multiple. They tend to produce personal dramas that displace structural explanations of migration. They risk reproducing a, a scapegoating logic where blame is projected onto migrants instead of clearly identifying the historical and structural reasons for migration in the first place, often rooted in long-standing practices of colonialism and more recently corporate global extractivism and land grabs and economic destruction of livelihoods. Also, Part of this logic is the visual element, where complex socio-political phenomena are drastically reduced and projected onto the appearance of people in ways that are often racializing and othering, often in unconscious ways, where the privileged subjects of migrant photojournalism and artistic representation are at least sometimes unaware of these dynamics, though not necessarily always. In doing so, the photography of faces invites a modality of viewer reception invested in spectacularizing misery, generating guilt, and producing compassion, and with it, a false sense of caring and intervening, or, con or conversely, 
um, producing or reproducing uh, right-wing xenophobic blame or racist exclusion, fortifying extremist social media, reactionary ethno nationalist politics, and politicizing pedagogy, um, sorry, and the militarization of borders, rather than a critical viewership that gains from an engaged and politicizing pedagogy in understanding the structural conditions from which reality, including its in inequalities and oppressive forces, is constructed. So the problems associated with the photography of faces explains why Clark called instead for a photography of causes, about which, at the time, he could only speculate. But I think now there's lots more um, material to work with in relationship to this. So in, in 2015, uh, a year of historically unprecedented Europe-bound uh, migration from North Africa in particular, uh, Slavoj Žižek provided the following related analysis. He wrote, uh, the first thing is to recall that most of refugees come from the, quote, failed states where public authority is more or less inoperative, at least in large regions, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Congo, etc. This disintegration of state power is not a local phenomena, but a result of international economy and politics, in some cases like Libya and Iraq, a direct outcome of Western intervention. It's clear that the rise of these so-called failed states is not just an unintended misfortune, but also one of the ways the great powers exert their economic colonialism. I see this analytical focus as critical in shifting our regard from the photography of faces to one of causes, which, as I've argued elsewhere, is the necessary beginning of politicization, to see ourselves not as distanced, objective, neutral observers, or as liberal consumers of guilt in the face of spectacles of misery, or of the aestheticization of victimhood, but as part of a larger cultural and historical conditioning, best characterized by racialized class war, in which migrants are produced by the kind of economic colonialism that Zizek references. So in pursuit of that phase shift and thinking along with this logic, I'll focus today on uh, the photography of causes investigated by an aesthetic and forensic research practice, specifically the so-called cold cases of Susan Shupley, uh, an artist and also the director of the forensic architecture uh, program at Goldsmiths in London, which works backwards toward the structural origins of migration, at least uh, in this project. This formulation addresses one of the central concerns of this conference. How are social dislocations interconnected with the technical evolutions of the mobile medium of photography? In considering Shupley's practice, I'm invoking a post-photographic networked image and video-based uh, practice, which in many ways signals the current correlation between the twin developments of 21st century media technology, which is digitized, seemingly immaterial, cloud-based computing, algorithm algorithmically and AI processed, immersed within social media, and also surveillance capitalism. On the one hand, and on the other, migration as increasingly a site of visually mediated intersectionalist social complexity marked by environmental transformation and extreme weather events, military and political violence, and ex economic hardship. But rather than asking uh, exactly uh, what, my, what modifications in aesthetics and style and methods and practices of photography do temporary mobility, geographical relocation, and resettlement imply, as the conference organizers ask, importantly. I'm putting the, uh, the, um, the highlight on investigating what modifications in aesthetics, and also by extension politics, are required by and result from a photography or media of causes, rather than of faces. 
In approaching the photography of causes, though in many ways the term photography, as I just was explaining, is not so much a valid, a valid analytic category for current media uh, and imaging technologies, my approach builds on the work of FAs, forensic architectures, methodology, particularly where they propose a phase shift in their image analyses from figure to ground, or rather in a topological inversion toward or to a causal ecology that connects figure to ground. As A.L. Weitzman uh, explains, the, um, the founder and director of forensic architecture, F.A. has attempted to move beyond the gestalt of human rights work divided between the figure, meaning individuals, testimonies, exhumations, and the ground, meaning collectives, territorial studies, epidemiology, which occupy opposite ends of the spectrum, opting for a third term, what he calls field causalities. Um, this enables the uh, examination of force fields, causal ecologies that are nonlinear, diffused, simultaneous, and involve multiple agencies and feedback loops, articulated through multiple foldings of figures into grounds, beings into their milieus, forms emerging out of origins, influencing these grounds in return. That, might, that may be quite dense to just hear uh, um, verbally, but I'm going to try to unpack this and explain why this is a really helpful and enabling way to think about um, just the complexity of the ways in which images and subjectivities and relations to uh, forms of power that are causing transformations in our environmental and political conditions all interconnect or in, are enmeshed together. So Shupley's cold cases, instead of reading environments as passive, neutral backgrounds for figurative dramas, for, for instance, stories of migration, psychodramas of passage, sociopolitical circumstances of biography, set within natural conditions beyond human control. Instead, she investigates how states and security organizations actively shape environments as agential containers, instrumentalized according to a biopolitical logic of ambient control in order to influence behaviors, even strip subjects of rights and create conditions of deterrence, and even, in some cases, torture. This she calls a new thermopolitics, thermal relating to temperature, like thermal. So a thermopolitics defined by modulating ambient temperatures beyond human comfort zones, according to which cold has been weaponized as a tactical instrument of policing, of custody, and detention of largely, mainly indigenous and migrant bodies. As such, the cold cases expose what she writes as the degree to which temperature becomes a register of violence, one that includes the legacies of climate colonialism, long-standing socioeconomic inequalities, and ongoing structural racism. This is what more broadly I term uh, climate control, uh, as I've written about in past um, essays, for instance this one, where environment at the intersection of life and technology becomes operationalized by state and military force in order to achieve the aims of social management and biopolitical domination. So let me, let me look quickly at three select examples where the ground of colonial history and racist politics creates the subjects of displacement rather than viewing migrant subjects as somehow invading neutral and innocent geographies, which is the familiar scenario of right-wing xenophobia and eco-fascist narratives. Um, these you can all find online um, uh, through Susan Shupley's Cold Cases website. So the first one, uh, Freezing Deaths, uh, investigates the widespread and patterned practice occurring over decades of Canadian police in cities from Saskatoon to Vancouver and Quebec of conducting so-called starlight tours where racialized people, especially First Nations members, come into the custodial care of authorities. In such cases, they're driven out to desolate areas 
and then let go in the middle of the night without resources or direction, where dropping temperatures became, have become lethal weapons and tools of force. Shupley's project identifies the ultimate cause of willful neglect and this kind of lethal abandonment as, in her words, structural racism and settler colonialism. A second project is weaponizing water, where the states, in this case the US, um, and its militarized police have provided repressive security and support for fossil fuel infrastructure development to force through the Dakota Access Pipeline on indigenous territory, including protected sacred burial grounds and heritage sites, uh, instrumentalizing in the course dangerous weather conditions, as well as um, subjecting protesters to military armaments in the climate control of indigenous water protectors. Um, environmental activists and international allies who were hosed with water in minus 10 degrees Celsius weather in the middle of the night in 2016, November, along with being subjected to explosive and stun grenades, rubber bullets, LRAD sound cannons, and tear gas. By drenching resistors, the police um, created the conditions of dangerous hypothermia even as they blocked emergency medical services from reaching those suffering harm. In doing so, they ironically subjected activists to the weaponization of the very elements, water and air, uh, that they were dedicated to protecting from the incursions of fossil fuel pollution that are in the process of transforming living land, supporting diverse peoples and biodiverse life into an extractive zone servicing the economic profits of capital. And finally, uh, icebox detention, um, which also, these all include videos, but for the, because of lack of time, I'm not playing the videos, but there's, they offer more information um, in that context, as well as on the website. Um, lots of uh, research, art, uh, kind of research art practice. So this one, Icebox Detention, uh, researches the architecture of containment for asylum seekers and migrants on the US-Mexico border, where the adjustment of temperature to produce experiential discomfort is used as a calculated tactic of administering psychological and physiological pain meant to deter border crossings, but which in actuality simply subject dispossessed people often driven to desperation, to cruel and gratuitous state violence. We can understand these police counterinsurgency and border control practices as the deployment of environmental techniques developed in military engagements abroad uh, from the US perspective over decades of US warfare from Vietnam to Iraq which included experiments in weaponizing environments, such as bombing ice shells and oceans to create artificial tsunamis and drown coastal cities, or producing firestorms in forest areas, or altering the temperature of sea currents to disrupt the enemy's climate and food production, or using biological agents to contaminate land, water, and air. These were all Cold War um, uh, strategic military um, um, uh, tactics. From the use of tear gas to produce what some call settler atmospherics, to the use of water to intensify hypothermia, or the lowering of ambient temperatures for environmental deterrence and border security, these techniques of climate control represent modes of compelling bodily movements, which are only the most explicit forms of displacement, extending from racial colonial capitalism's uprooting forces which create unlivable conditions, fostering or necessitating migration. This understanding of uh, settler atmospherics is far from, um, sorry, I wanted to show this uh, before. This is, a, this is one, good, there's increasingly more research on this about how environments have been weaponized within military tactics. This is just one example. Uh, but this book by Jacob um, uh, Hamblin is uh, quite interesting, Arming Mother Nature. And of course, uh, maybe we're most familiar with the, the case of Vietnam uh, and the use of uh, defoliant chemicals uh, spread on, uh, on forests in order to um, um, debilitate the, uh, the enemy in, in, that, in that context. 
So this understanding of uh, settler um, atmospherics, um, uh, and this is still from Shupley's Weaponizing Water that shows you some of the interaction with tear gas and water between the militarized police and um, indigenous water protectors. This is far from uh, the potentially passive construction of climate change, in much, which we hear about in much scientific and mainstream discourse, which imputes no cause or subject um, uh, behind transformation, and most often describes a spatially and temporally dispersed transformation of Earth's natural systems as something that's non-knowable, ultimately, um, that contributes to an apolitical, mystifying form of thinking. For instance, what Timothy Morton, uh, in perhaps the most oversighted term ever of eco-criticism, calls a hyper-object, which describes, in his words, um, things that are massively distributed in time and space relative to humans, and about which the more data we have, the less we know about them, uh, the more we realize we can never truly know them. Conversely, uh, Shupley's project focuses on uh, the weaponization of environments, and specifically temperature, um, generally by the corporate state complex of illiberal racial capitalism as a vector of more precise, politically enabling, and materially specific analysis through which migrants are produced, but in ways completely different from the technologies of media spectacularization upon which artists like Collins was focused. Uh, although specific individuals do feature in Shupley's project, it's far from a photography of faces and resists the temptation to uh, reproduce and perpetuate the ideological machine of compassion that arguably assuages or attempts to assuage liberal guilt, funds NGOs with elite philanthrocapitalist resources and does little to critically address the causality of climate breakdown and the migration that results from it. Instead, hers is what I'll term a media of causes that offers a crucial methodology for investigating the migratory conditions of fossil capitalist environmental violence that rather than tracing migration routes forensically reconstructs the reasons for displacement in the first place. In this regard, climate breakdown is not an impersonal, transhistorical, biogeophysical transition akin to what Deepesh Chakrabarti considers a passage beyond politics and a reflection of the pre-capitalist evolutionary dynamics of anthropological development, which he traces back thousands of years. Instead, it's a socio-political practice of power located within the ongoing conditions of colonial racial capitalism, which demonstrate the co-constitution and entanglement of slavery and, col and colonialism from the conquest of the new world through industrial capitalism to contemporary financial capitalism, as the editors of, of the book uh, Colonial Racial Capitalism write, which just came out last year. Most recently, this entails militarized policing, often at the behest of multinational extractive corporations and ruling class interests, which subject real people to what I'm calling the dislocating social and experiential effects of climate violence. In focusing on sites of state violence, including refugee detention, and um, US border control and their mili the, the conditions of growing militarized policing, as well as the US border control's weaponization of temperature as deterrence and punishment, including against women and children. Shupley's project doesn't account for the large scale regional causality of fossil capital's transformation of ecosystems and the metabolic rift of natural systems. Uh, which is leading to widespread prolonged drought and warming that can and likely will continue to destroy agriculture and the indigenous subsistence economies of small landholders, ho traditional farming communities, and peasant forest dwellers in the global south. Here, I'm th that, that was very long, but I'm thinking of, for instance, US, the US's longstanding uh, Central American policy in places like, um, that have affected profoundly places like Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, 
um, uh, including in ways that have transformed climates and led to wide-scale drought that has destroyed uh, agricultural viability and led to the kind of waves of migration that we see today at the U.S. southern border. Um, but you rarely, if ever, hear about the causality behind that. All you hear about is um, the, the fear um, and the kind of uh, racist alarmism around the migrants themselves. Um, um, okay, other, uh, other examples. And neither, neither does Shipley's practice address uh, the state-scaled implications of military conflicts, such as the U.S.'s endless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, or Russia's more recent invasion and assault on Ukraine, um, or um, Saudi Arabia's long-standing bombing of Yemen, or Syria's disastrous civil war, and the resulting mass displacements that result, all of which uh, also have complex relations to the causes and consequences of climate change. Nor does her project, it's true, point to the scale of future climate refugees, uh, where global society will see millions of people on the move owing to climate breakdown in coming years because of drought, wildfires, floods, melting ice, rising seas, and the like, according to most recent predictions, which will make 2015, the year of unprecedented European-bound migration, seem like a minor event. In some ways, uh, Ai Weiwei's film, Human Flow, elicits the global scale of migration, but again, in focusing on its subjective faces, fails to investigate the causes, or say anything really about the causes. But by focusing on the ground, instead of the more common visual figuration of migration, Shupley, invests, uh, Shupley provides a methodology of analysis, a forensic framing, and a media of causes that shifts our focus away from liberal humanitarianism and its production of compassion, and toward the necessary collective politicization around the weaponized environments of racial and colonial capitalism. It's there, I think, I'm arguing, that we must direct our focus toward an insurgent knowledge capable of contributing to building a majoritarian, multiracial, class-based politics necessary to stop the machinery of fossil capital and bring about a real material redistribution of wealth and a real democratic equality which uniquely holds the promise, but without any guarantees, of stopping the causality of climate disaster. So this is um, partly what I'm investigating in my most recent book, um, and just a few practices that I'm looking at there in terms of radical futurisms, those of coming out of genealogies of indigenous futurisms, mostly in the Americas, black quantum futurism and its relationship to traditions of Afrofuturisms, um, assemblist practices of political gathering by, for instance, the Dutch artist Jonas Stahl and the German curator Florian Meltzacher, um, and projects of institutional liberation like uh, the, the project called Strike MoMA that um, critically analyzed the, the economic conditions of possibility for the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which is dependent on this kind of toxic billionaire philanthropy. Um, so that's this book that uh, as it is just coming out right now, um, in, uh, which should be available, I believe, uh, by, by now, in, especially in, in Germany, because this publisher is Sternberg Press, based in uh, Berlin, or un until recently. So uh, finally, in conclusion, a media of causes provides um, three things I'll mention. One is a comprehensive political analysis that enables new figurations of resistance catalyzing strategic new compositions and social movement politics where migrant justice connects to climate justice. Two, it offers a clear picture of political and economic antagonism in relation to which class consciousness can develop under the reconfigured terms of climate disaster and, long, and along with it, um, multiracial internationalist solidarity. And three, it challenges corporate media's racialized, liberal, and eco-fascist figurations that pin causality on those who are really the subjective effects of fossil capitalist violence. Instead, it names the structural networks of power that generate, increasingly with AI technology and full-spectrum surveillance, images of migrants and migrant images where the nomadic camera designates an immersive and controlled space-time matter 
rather than any specific singular mobile device. That modulated space-time matter, our, design, our increasingly designed surround, expresses the dystopian logic of distributed cybernetic automation, increasingly restricted our, restricting our view of the world to small screens and their seduct seductive reflections of the nexus of capital, technology, and environment. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.